how you spend your days is how you spend your life. So it's really about finding these like small joyful moments in every bit of what you do. Well, thank you so much for being on the Active Ingredient Podcast. I can't tell you how excited I am to hear about your journey and your story because I genuinely am such a fan of your product. Like I really, really am. I was telling you before we started, I smuggled your product into the Dominican Republic. So I am so excited. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me and for the really kind words. Yeah. Where are you right now? I'm in Los Angeles. I'm in our office. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Okay, so I kick off every single podcast asking the guests what they were like as a kid that they remember. Um, I don't know if you remember your childlike qualities um, or if, you know, your family members, I know you were really close with your grandmother, if like people tell you what you were like as a kid um, and if you find that those qualities are in your personality right now. Hmm. I think as a kid, I was hyper energetic which i still am today and i was extremely curious like i wanted to know everything i wanted to be in all the conversations with the adults i wanted to like have answers detailed answers to all of my questions of which there were many um and uh and i think maybe i've chilled out a little bit now but i'm still someone who really wants to like discover the world and and learn a lot um but i think those were maybe the two main qualities like insatiable. Oh, I love that word. Insatiable mm -hmm. curiosity, I think, is the common denominator of the best entrepreneurs of our time um, or of all time, actually. I think that that curiosity is what takes you extremely far. Um, I'm curious, though, because your career trajectory is just so incredible. Um, have you had that level of that or like, you know, being able to tap into that level of curiosity throughout your entire life? Or did you find that at different points in your life you were maybe not so um aware or attached to those childlike qualities and then you found found your way back to them or they've always been there i think they've pretty much always been there i think they maybe were a little bit you know tamed when i was in like middle school and high school which was uh, i think that the the french system is so different from here it's like you go to school and you go home and i was doing a lot of ballet to sort of you know quench my thirst for adventure then but um then when i moved to the us for college that was like just so incredible you know i went to brown it was like a liberal art school it was so different it was like you can take any class you want you can you know, learn about any subject you want. And I ended up, you know, majoring in economics, but taking a lot of like architecture and visual arts classes. And, you know, I was working for like the school cafeteria and, you know, that had 10 different restaurants. And I was just like, there was so much to do and so much to see. And um, I was so busy all the time. Like I remember being always so tired because I would like work until 2 a.m. and then like work at the big shop at 6 30 and then you know like uh, take like all the classes that I could and studio hours and it was just like super amazing so I think after that you know it sort of transitioned into my professional life and discovering New York and all of that but I think college was really where I peaked. So do you think like the reason I asked the question is that I sometimes find that like like in middle school high school when you're in such like regimented life you know like everything is so pre-planned for you like you have kind of just like the way of going about things that people in the past have done that it kind of mutes these qualities that are our unique differentiators that are the things that help us figure out what our you know secret sauce is in life um what are your thoughts on that like does that ring true for you is that something i don't know if you plan on having kids but like is that something that you think about when like uh, like on next generations, how we can cultivate more of that uniqueness in this life versus just cookie cutter, you know, going about things and muting our uniqueness. For sure. I mean, I hated high school. I was so miserable. I really felt like there was nothing that was, I was finally starting to form as an adult and nothing was within my control. And so, I, and I think that's part of the reason like that's, you know, ultimately how I ended up in the United States is I was just so dying to learn and open, like expand my horizons and so I found out about brown like on the internet and I just applied you know it was like not something that people like in small towns outside of Lyon did but it was I was so frustrated with school I, I you know I was in an international school when I was younger and then when I moved to my high school I remember like they wouldn't let me take 
even all the languages that I had learned. So I completely lost my German and, you know, they had like a really kind of like low level of like Spanish and they were like, no, you have to take like Latin or Greek. And I was like, this is just for reading, you know, ancient texts. I, I'm not going to suddenly pick up these languages and not continue learning Spanish. And I was so frustrated with a very Catholic school and I was so frustrated with just like the narrow mindedness. And I feel like I was constantly rebelling. Like I had really good grades and I was constantly getting kicked out of school. And so that's when, you know, I think I decided like I wanted to study in a different way. The French system didn't work for me. I also went to a Catholic school here in Miami and super extremely regimented. And I also just felt like it was not and I don't know if this is how I feel about like the system in general for everything. It just, I, I don't think that it lets uniqueness come to the forefront. It makes it go to sleep. And yeah. the journey of active ingredient or like the, the, what I've seen be the path for all the incredible people that I've interviewed on the show is a coming home, like a coming back to what you were before you were silenced or kind of like put into a system that made you be cookie cutter. And then you kind of just remember who you actually are. You know, for sure. It's exactly what it is. You know, I think there was definitely this like moment in my life where I, my grandmother passed away and I had spent every summer with her. She was just like this incredible. I'm, I'm sure everyone thinks their grandmother is an incredible woman, but like <laughs> I think mine was really so extraordinary and that she was just so generous and she was so talented. And, you know, she grew up with nothing and she would make extraordinary out of the mundane and uh, there was never a boring day and everything deserved to be celebrated and so you know when she passed away very suddenly she was still super young and super active and I was just like it was just like such a moment in my life that was like a before and an after because it was also the moment in your life where you like lose your favorite person who you know loves you the most in the world I was definitely my grandmother's favorite that was just I her first it. grandchild we were so close we spent so much time together and you know I think like I was like a mini adult. I was always asking questions. She would answer all of them. She would take so much time with me. And, and so, you know, Gia for me is so much of it is inspired by the way she does things. I mean, she made so many aperitivos. She made so much food that had a lot of alcohol and a lot of sugar. So it's like, we've definitely updated the formulas, but everything <laughs> that we do, we do with this sort of like generosity and this idea that like, you don't need to have a birthday party to celebrate. It can just be 6 PM and you can have a drink that's really good for yourself. And, honoring the ingredients in the season. And she always said, you know, when you live in the sun, she lived in the South of France. She said, when you lived in the sun, you have the same problem as when you don't, but you have the sun. And I always like, you know, when I moved to LA, I was like, oh, I live in the sun now, you know? I always have the sun. I love that. <laughs> so it's just like, I, I think that. this coming home of like figuring out, you know, through my career, what I wanted to do, but ultimately like, and this is why also I think it's like, it's so difficult to lead because it's not just a business. Like I'm not, this is, this is like, it, it has like my family's soul in it. You know, it's like my, it's an my grandmother's baby. It's an extension of yeah. you and your soul. Yeah. So it has to be right. And, and when I hear, you know, I met with a, a potential marketing candidate yesterday who lives in Chicago, comes from a completely different background that I did. And she said that when Gia launched, like she really resonated with it and it reminded her of her childhood memories which were not, you know, ever in Europe or whatnot. And I was like, wow, the fact that this nostalgia is actually transferable and people can relate to it, like that's really magical for me. That's the coming I home. Love that. I love that so much. And there's something so special about your brand. Like there are other brands that are playing in this category. I'm excited to see that there's more coming into the space, but, and I want to get into the journey, but before we even get into it, I just want to have a moment of telling you that like you can feel, I actually didn't know the story of your grandmother before I started doing research for this podcast, but I've been consuming your product for a very long time, like since pr pro probably like a few months after it launched. And there is something really special and it does make sense to me that it has this familial tie, that it has so much intention behind it because even if you don't know the story, there's something energetic about it that you feel. And now that you say it, it makes so much more sense to me. And by the way, I'm also that close with my grandmother. She just left back to Venezuela and like, she's literally my best friend too. So like I, I understand you entirely, fully and completely. Um, so, okay, I want to get into Gia. I want to understand, I kind of want to get a brief understanding of your career beforehand because you did work at some incredible places. Um, I'm going to talk about them in the intro so we don't need to go into full detail, but I just, I'm really curious, like when you kept going to each one of them because they were all these like now household names, like 
what was it that would draw you to each one? You're going to mention them in the intro. I should not go into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Podcast. I'm going to. Um, so, yeah. Dig in, Sorry. Glossier, um, American Eagle. Like, you've worked at all these huge brands. I, I'm going to talk about them in more detail in the intro. Okay. But I'm curious, like, for you, like, what. You don't have to go through the whole, like, trajectory, but, like, what was it that would, like, take you to the next breadcrumb? Because I feel like they're all breadcrumbs. They all probably gave you some learnings that brought you to Gia. But do you remember when you would make those calls and make those decisions of leaving a household name to go to a household name? Like, what was it that was pulling you? For sure. I mean, you know, I think the first one was joining Goldman Sachs, and that was a little bit strategic. It was it was like I, I went to school during the financial crisis. I had very much, like, put, like, you know, so much money into my education. Like, school in France is free. It was a huge risk for me coming from where, you know, I come from to be going to Brown. And like when the crisis hit, it was like no one was getting jobs. Uh, no one yeah. was getting visas sponsored. And I really wanted to stay. And um, I got this internship at Goldman Sachs that was, it felt like completely got sent. And I also really looked up to like the rigor. You know, it's a path that a lot of my friends and friends took working in finance because it's like a very safe path um and i really wanted to build up you know that skill set that was always also very analytical as much as i like wasn't that interested in like math and you know quant like school came pretty easy to me and so it felt like a really natural like safe trajectory and this offered to sponsor my visa so i joined their analyst program for two years and then you know i was working in natural resources and really when i decided to leave i wanted to work in an industry that was a little bit more tangible and one of the firm's client was American Eagle Outfitters, and they were looking for um, some, you know, analysts to join their strategy group. So that felt like a really nice, like, general way of, you know, still working with people that had the same background as me, but maybe working in an industry that I felt was more relatable and I could understand better. And then they actually very quickly shut down the strategy group, and I didn't really want to work like in a huge corporation like that. And it's very coincidentally that I met the CEO of Digin. I used to eat there all the time. And, you know, because of my upbringing, I was very interested in food. I had, you know, ran the uh, dining services when I was at Brown, which is like a very like hospitality focused job, very like also operational. And when I moved to the U.S., like I started having these like horrible stomach pains. I always had stomach pains and a sensitive stomach, but I realized that there was something about the food system in America that was so different. And I had been really spoiled with really high quality food my entire childhood. And I was really interested in how to, you know, help America eat better. And I think that was really close to the mission for Diggin. And, and I randomly met with the CEO and he was really building the team. They only had six restaurants at the time. So it wasn't a household name yet, but it was kind of like my local eatery, if you will. Um, we yeah. used to order which Diggin on location? Seamless Web. I think it was the Pine Street location, which is one of the original ones, like the financial district mm -hmm. one. When I was at Goldman, which was 2011, 12. And wow. we had like a Seamless Web credit in the evening to get dinner and we would order from Diggin pretty much. So I joined the team over at Dig, and I, I it's now called Dig, and that was just like, such an incredible experience they really allowed me to you know cut my teeth um and uh and learn so much and work in marketing and then designing the restaurants which i had always had such a keen interest in design and you know it's it felt like after three years there my job was kind of done and i also randomly met someone at glossier the team was growing super quickly and glossier was like a more natural transition because it was at the time it was just the hot brand in downtown New York that like you, if you like brands, you loved Glossy. Like they were exploding. It was such a fun, you know, the aesthetic and the way that they were working with like community. And it just felt like very frenetic, but in a very positive way. And so when they offered me a job, I was like, I could not say no. I was so excited. Wait, so I want to understand how you started refining your love of brand. Like, how did you know going from Goldman Sachs and then eventually Glossier, like, how do you identify that in yourself that you're like, oh, I, I can transition and I wanted to transition into the world of brand? Well, it wasn't like so intentional. It really happened when I was at Dig In. But, you know, I always loved design and I would always like look, I don't know, I'm, I always loved like vintage objects. And I always had like a very, an aesthetic that was very much mine. And like, I never really liked trends. And when I was leaving American Eagle Outfitters, I had I was, I had applied to business school thinking like, oh, now would be a good time. And then 
kind of like forgot about it and joined Dig. And like five days after I joined, you know, Dig, I got into Harvard Business School. And I was like, oh shit, you know, I was like, well, do you, you can't say no to Harvard. And um, we started talking and it was when this fundraise was happening. I don't know if it was like five days, but it was like maybe two months. In. I, don't, I don't remember. It was very early yeah. on. And then, you know, we sort of had this conversation, like I hadn't worked there so long, but the CEO was like, look, like you need to be making the decision of whether you stay or you go. I don't want to influence that. But if you want to stay and there's things you want to learn on the job, like I'm also happy to do that. Like you've contributed so far. And that's when I transitioned to becoming director of marketing there. And then I also took on the role of creative director because we were opening all these restaurants and I was like, I don't really like how this looks. I think maybe we should do this and that. And it was like slowly but surely. And, you know, people always ask me like, how do you build this experience? How do you get these jobs? And I'm like, work at a startup because there's so much to do. It's really like, there's a project who wants to grab it and you'll be exposed to the most, you know, experience. It's the fastest way to grow. And to learn is to like by doing, at least for me. And so, you know, it was just like, I was exposed to so many things. It was not like, like I wasn't like getting promoted. Like we were a super small team. It was literally just like, there's this project, like, do you want to try? And uh, yeah, for sure. We were moving super fast. Do you ever think back on going to Harvard? Like now that you've had so much hands-on experience and know that you're a learner that do like you learn by doing, do you think that it's something that is beneficial? In hindsight? I mean, so I had a little bit of like a homecoming moment uh, a few months ago because one of the finance classes wrote a case study on Gia and they actually invited me to speak oh. there, which was just so crazy. So it was like, I, I literally goosebumps. attended. It, it was crazy. And, and it was also like, it's so funny because when I got into Harvard, like my parents got like Harvard mom and Harvard dad sweatshirts and then they were like, we bought this for nothing. <laughs> Oh, they so could wear it again in 2022. I know. I was like, you can wear your sweatshirt. I was a guest, you know, at Harvard Finance today. And um, and so that was, uh, you know, I was actually thinking that during the class. I was like, wow, this is such a cool way of learning. You get exposed to all of these, like, real-life business problems. And But ultimately, like, you know, getting an, H, uh, getting a, an MBA from HBS was a luxury. It was so expensive. I, I you know, was very lucky to be debt-free. And... I just didn't want to start that again. So, you know, I, I love school and I love learning. And I think that's really like one of the core of my being. And so I don't exclude someday going back to school. So okay. I don't think it will be an MBA, but I definitely think that in the next 10 years, I will probably, you know, study. I, I would love to go to either culinary school or do an MFA in sculpture. Sculpture? interesting yes. interesting okay. you're a fascinating like you are like a renaissance person with so many interests um I can totally see the insatiable curiosity I also find it to be so interesting that I've seen so many people speak at Harvard business that did not go to business school you know what I mean it's mm -hmm. like interesting to me that they are having these speakers come in that did not go their path and speak yeah. about their successful businesses I think it's cool um, I want to go back to what you touched on, on your journey with food from living in, in France to then coming to the U S. Um, cause I've heard on podcasts before that you, that you've done a lot of research on the food system and what is the actual difference in what we're eating? I mean, I think anyone who's traveled abroad to Europe can experience. My mom literally just came back from Paris and she was like, it's so crazy how like she has IBS and she was like, I literally ate whatever. And my, I, my thing did not flare up at all like yeah what is up like what is happening and like you talk about like this this um that you had this luxury of how you ate growing up but to me I'm like that's not luxury I think that that's our birthright is to eat that way but we're not sure that way right now which is our birthright you know yeah I mean but I, I you know it was not like I didn't grow up you know in a family that like could afford like luxurious food i don't really have a lot of memories of even like going out to dinner we cooked most of our meals at home and but i think just the quality of the food was so much better than exactly. whatever food you bought in supermarkets you know i mean we also grew up there was a little farmer's market on the weekends or on wednesdays and we would go and get food at the farmer's market and we would have you know we had chickens in my garden and so we would get the eggs from the chickens um for as long as they lived and then I don't know. I just feel like when I moved here, everything started to break down. You know, I was foggy and I always had these stomach pains and 
I think that, you know, we're so, a lot of people don't have access to healthy food in America, like packaged food or fast food chains are the most approachable option. You know, you, it's very hard to compete with like a dollar burger from McDonald's, but I'm also like, what could possibly be in the burger that costs $1? It's, there's no way, you know, that is high quality meat. And we've really subsidized, you know, um, genetically modified, you know, wheat and grains and, um, it's all really detrimental. And by the way, like IBS like, is not a root cause. It's a set of symptoms. And I also, you know, had IBS and then they were like, oh, you have Crohn's and you need to be on steroids. And I was like, no, 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 none of that. That's never happening. What else can I do? And I remember this gastroenterologist like made fun of me and they were like, oh, you're going to go like all natural and like eat like coconut water for like two months. And I remember thinking I need a new doctor, you know, and that was like an NYU doctor. Um, and so I was like, yes. And I started seeing a functional medicine doctor and I did an elimination diet. Turned out I was very sensitive to dairy and it had, you know, it took like six months to feel better. And you sort of had to trust that you could do it on your own. But I was just like refusing to be put on steroids at that 25 years old. And now I can have everything. Um, I think also the way that we treat, you know, these symptoms um, is is not healthy. And like, it's, it's also about knowing your body. And now, I'm, you know, it's like, it's very hard because I work so much, but I'm really careful about what I eat. And I don't really, and like, and I have, I eat everything. Like I love making pasta and I love all of this stuff, but I really just avoid packaged food. That's what I was going to ask you. Like given all the research that you've done and like knowing how your body takes the same food, like even if it's dairy in Europe versus having it in the U S um, do you notice a difference? Yes. I think I just generally try to avoid dairy, but it's like summer in France and it's really hot. Like I'm going to have an ice cream, you know? So it's like in general, I, I'm just like, not that I know it's like, I don't put cheese on my salad every day. Like I used to, I right. also used to think that having a yogurt in the morning was really healthy. And it's like, well, when you're lactose intolerant, it's not, you know? And so that was one of the things where it's like just defaulting to other things. Um, but now I can have, you know, a little bit of everything in moderation. I would say, I think that the, quality you know unfortunately i think the quality is also going down in europe now it's just a reality yeah. of like seeing since i left and since i was growing up but um but in general like avoiding packaged foods and trying to you know eat as locally as possible and i also really believe like you vote with your dollars and so supporting farmers markets and supporting organic producers even if it's a little bit more expensive is you know i never buy organic like conventional foods I never buy vegetables that come in plastic just because like in principle I just hate that um so I'll just take the time to cut my pineapple or my grapefruit or whatever it is so that those are just like small things that are like my way of rebelling against the system <laughs> and I'm sure that when I have kids like I'll also throw fits at the school food because that's like another thing on my mind <laughs> totally 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 Okay, so you spoke about the fact that you have chosen not to drink. And I know, I don't know if you use the word sober or if it's something that you just like say, I just choose not to drink because it doesn't make me feel good. I've also been on this path. I have not been drinking that much, which is why Gia has been such an amazing product. It feels socially acceptable. It feels like I'm really, I am so grateful for you and for brands that are going into the space that exists for us that don't want to drink, not because there's any other problem other than the fact that it doesn't make us feel good. And like, I said this in the prep questions, but like, why is it like, why is it that the norm is to accept putting alcohol, which is poison? Like when, when you feel hungover, it's because your body's literally trying to eliminate poison out of your system. So why is it that the normal is that, and the person that doesn't choose to put poison in them is other and is the outcast? And how have you dealt with that? Because you chose this a long time ago. Like I chose this not, not so long ago for myself, you know, like, how have you, how have you coped? Yeah. Well, you know, I think that the reason why I started, yeah, is because I wanted to break down the stigmas. I was so frustrated by them and I felt like they were so against like my person. Like I'm someone who, as I said, like I have a lot of energy. I like love to bring people together. I love to cook. I was constantly hosting. I was like, people in New York don't know how to cook. They don't know how to host. No one has the space. And I would always like say, okay, come back for dinner. I'll make like a chicken or I'll make something really simple. And suddenly we're like 20 people in my really minuscule, like, you know, <laughs> like 
at my minuscule dining table and I was like still feeling really excluded because I wasn't drinking. And it's because we've been conditioned to think that alcohol is the life of the party for decades, decades of, you know, marketing dollars, like alcohol is highly addictive. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, someone who deals with addiction or not, like it's a highly addictive substance and it sells really well. And so um, it's like a huge industry of many billions of dollars. Um, and so it's like a lot of people profit from that. So I think that, you know, it's kind of interesting to see this change now where people are just like asking for better options. And, you, you know, the, the best way to see that alcohol is poison is like stop drinking for three months and then have one glass of tequila and see how you feel. You know, it's like you'll feel it immediately. Our bodies are so amazing that they, you know, can build up tolerance. But as someone who now doesn't drink on the regular, like if I have a martini, I'll get really loose, you know, <laughs> I'll just be really totally. drunk really quickly. And, um, and so it's kind of interesting because I think there's also all these stereotypes and especially in America, actually, where it's like, you need to drink to cope, which is, I, I feel like alcohol, at least in France and the environment that I grew up was like much more celebratory, but we also just find any reason to celebrate. Like that was kind of the <laughs> home that I grew up in. It would be like, it's Tuesday, let's have a drink, you know? Or like, like also, I, I just in my house in the summer, like aperitivo was a twice a day thing. There's the 11.30 a.m. one, and then there's the, like wow. my parents and grandparents drank at lunch, which now feels so crazy to me, but it was like an all the time thing. There would be like pastis at five and then like aperitivo at six, you know? And so I, I just like grew up around it, but it was always very cheerful. And I find that here it's almost like a coping mechanism. It's like, there's all these stereotypes, my, uh, the one, that is my number one enemy is the wine mom stereotype because I'm like, I think that you would find it easier to be a mom if you, you know, didn't drink, but a lot of women feel like because they're moms, they have to drink. And I'm like, that's just so sad. Like you shouldn't be felt, you, you shouldn't be, you know, meant to feel this way. And so um, I'm, that's really what we're going against. You know, I think like, yeah, it's like been a wonderful outlet and it's so beautiful. But to me, the real success is that 85% of our customers identify as drinkers. They're not, you know, people who are sober with a capital S. They're not people who are, you know, pregnant necessarily. Like overall, like our customers seeking moderation because they understand that this is not good for them, but they gravitate toward Dia because it's a joyful brand. And that's where, we, that's what I'm the most proud of. It's so, you've, you've like grabbed it so perfectly. Like you have really just put that, the best of both worlds, like, I love Aperol Spritz season because of the joy of the, what that cup mm -hmm. means. It means the start of the summer. It means excitement, celebration. And when you pour a Gia into a glass, you get that same sensation. I am curious though, because I genuinely am a consumer of Gia. And I find that the areas in which I have the hardest time choosing non-alcoholic options are in places like a restaurant or a bar or places that I'm out with other people that we're celebrating something. And it's so much harder to find those options. Like I have Gia here. There's a restaurant here in Coconut Grove that sells it and I'll go have it, but I have it like here. It's not like out there in the world. Not, it is in some places it, it is at this restaurant served, but like I seek it out. It's not like, you know, you go anywhere and there's Casa Amigos, you know? Yeah. So how, how have you, I know that you're still early on in the business, but like that has to be the biggest hurdle is being seen or being in that level of like playing with the Casa Amigos of the world and being distributed at that level so that you can meet people where they are. Because if the option was there, I can guarantee you that more people would choose it. If you were there at the bar that I go out to in Wynwood, you know, I would be buying it. But I, instead I have to like bring my can or bring something that, that sometimes makes me feel more other. Cause it's like, Oh, there goes Sophie with like her woo woo stuff, you know? Yeah, no, totally. Well, first of all, I, I think you've, you've exactly, you know, figured out kind of like our main pinpoint here, which is we actually wanted to launch Gia in restaurants only because for me, it was like, oh, but the mission is not complete until people can actually go out with their friends and enjoy it there. And that's why, you know, all of our investors are like, why are you spending your time on restaurants? Like it doesn't bring that much revenue. And I'm like, yeah, but at the customer level, it's so important. And also like what we hear from the restaurants that have taken us on is like the drinks patronage is so strong because, you know, people like you or me will say like, who, you know, care about where they eat will say like, Oh, why don't we go there? And that way, you know, that you can have a drink and you know, by the way, like we're not price sensitive customers. Like 
you're going to end up paying for everyone else's alcohol at the drink anyways. So you well, might as well order so a cocktail for yourself. Can we talk about how annoying that is? Can we talk about how annoying that is? Like being the I'm friend who doesn't drink and I'm paying for literally everyone. Like, I know. It's, it's, it's so real. But I'm, like that I'm just like over because I also prefer it to being like, I didn't drink and I just want to spend no, like same. $20 I less. Like, like I just don't want the like, attention. I know. And I, it keeps happening, but I'm like, whatever. If I, if it means that I feel fine tomorrow, then I paid for everyone. Yeah. To drink and it is what it is. It's so good. Um, so have you, what has been like the hurdle though? Like, is it, is it, have you tried to play within the distribution system of spirits or is it like in its own category? So you can't be distributed by a huge spirits distributor. So this is a very layered question but basically the short answer is we don't want to be with a huge spirits distributor because we would get lost like they you know they would focus on casamigos because that's like a much higher level of revenue for them so we're focusing right now we self-distribute and we're focusing on taking on smaller regional distributors and then to answer your question around liquor it's actually state by state because the three-tier distribution mm. system is not the same in every state. So for instance, right. in New York, we can't be sold in a liquor store, but in LA, we do really well in wine shops. So that's, um, that's kind of like a multi, um, channel approach that's, you know, targeted to the markets where we go. So, um, yeah, but we're online everywhere now, which is nice everywhere in the U S. Oh, I really do love this brand. You guys like, for you listening, if you have not tried Gia, like I actually feel like a lot of my active ingredient listeners do try Gia, but if you haven't, like please, please, please do yourself a favor. It is so freaking good. Okay, but I want to get more like clear on tools that we can give our listener on if they're the friend that does not like drinking or that does not like how they feel when they drink or they, they just drink less or maybe they are completely just not drinking. What tools or advice or like stories do you have to share with them on how to be able to do it in a way that they can stop caring about what other people think? You know what I mean? I think it just takes like the first time is awkward. The second time is awkward. And the third time you're just like, I can do whatever I want. Like I feel so much better in the morning. Um, so it's just like trying it out. You know, I think it's for some people, they tell me it's harder when they're on vacation. And for some people, they tell me it's harder at like weddings or, you know, bigger functions. And Wedding. I think it's also, I brought my own to my friend's wedding. I literally brought my own to my friend's wedding. It's funny because we've actually been getting a lot of requests for wedding with people wanting to have like a non-alcoholic cocktail. So we're starting to do that now, which is really fun. Like we honor wholesale pricing on weddings. Literally, Last week I was at my best friend's wedding and my partner went to Boisson, I think it's called in Brooklyn, bought Mm -hmm. for me and took it to the bartender. And he was like, keep this for Sophie behind the bar. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. Um, so, and I, I've brought my idea places before as well, which is just like kind of a weird thing because I drink so much of it, but I don't seem to be getting sick of it. Um, but yeah, like I think, you know, I'm excited to see more options so that it becomes more of a category. I'm excited to see more high quality options because I think there's a lot of low quality options, unfortunately. Um, yeah. and you know, when this is more of a thing, cause it's like, I understand if customers don't want to drink only Gia, like I'm biased. It's my child. I think it's the best one. Um, but yeah. you know, I, 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 it's very hard to create complex flavors without the booze that will also be stable and not have preservative in them. So that's definitely a hurdle, but you know, I think that we're bound to see more better options come to the market soon. And we're also working on new flavors. So. Um, how, how do you preserve something that's like all de- it's derivative of herbs, right? Or it's extraction. Yeah. Extraction. So there's, there's juices and there's extracts. Um, our, you know, our cans have no preservative because we, we pasteurize some of the ingredients that are the highest risk ingredients and then keep um, some of the other ones. We do it at like different temperatures so that we really preserve the extracts. It's been a journey getting to that spritz, um, but as a result, it has none of it in it. We also have like some ingredients that are strong, you know, antibacterial extracts. So it actually our drink like preserves itself, but it's also finding the formula that is very balanced so that's they don't interact with each other and the formula remains stable. And then in our bottle, we have 0.03% of potassium sorbate, which is actually like the cleanest preservative. Um, and it's so little, but that's, it's not so much for before you open because once it's sealed, it's fine. It's for after in case it gets contaminated and something grows in the bottle, which now we know that it's very safe for four weeks, even if you leave it on your counter and not in the fridge. Uh, so we just want it to be safe with people because it's a tall bottle and 
you know, if people are going to be alternating between drinking and not drinking, I didn't want people to feel the pressure to drink the whole bottle in like a few days, like a bottle of wine I or did. something. In the beginning, so, I did feel that pressure. Oh, when I, yeah. Before I started buying the cans, because now I buy the cans. They have both. For yeah. the listeners that don't know, they have both. Because um, people are like, oh, the bottle is $33. It's expensive. And it's like, well, there's actually 10 to 12 servings in it. Um, right. And you don't have to consume it immediately. So, And if you keep it in your fridge, it will last even longer. Um, so I, it's, like a, it's like a more, I would say, like, you know, bio-friendly option maybe. And it's also more versatile for people who prefer slightly more sweet, you know. Um, they can mix it with ginger beer or they can mix it with like a flavored sparkling water or something like that. Like some people like to do one part Dia, one part juice, one part sparkling water, like grapefruit juice or something. Like just, I think it's a more lime. like choose your own adventure. Yes. A lime, an orange peel. Like sometimes I'll just get a nice glass with one of my big Negroni um, ice cubes. Mm-hmm. Gia with an orange peel or Gia with an uh, with a lime. Yeah, I love the orange peel. I've actually been like, there's so many citrus in LA right now and people literally put them in boxes like outside their doors and my neighbor has an enormous tree. And so she gave me all these oranges oh and I've been like slicing them and then just drying them in my oven overnight. So I have these big full slice of like dried orange that I just pop in on top of my cocktail. It's so nice. I <laughs> like love the it. small things. I also, okay. I, first of all, I love like the way that you, you're just, I feel like you're like a tastemaker. Like you're just like, and not intentionally, it's very like organic. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like even that, just the fact that you're even paying attention that, the, that your neighbor has a box of oranges, you know? Um, I am curious because I think that there is that, that misconception that if you're not drinking, you're boring and that you don't, have this like glamorous beautiful life or like this full life that people are like oh and they go to sleep at 7 p.m and it's just like a very you know sobering lame life but you're someone who travels and who I feel I mean I I don't know what your like nightlife life is like but like I you entertain a lot like can you talk to us what a life is like how many years is it that you don't that you haven't been drinking that much maybe like five or six now it's been a while to be honest like well I, I remember I think I was at Glossier so I, I left in 2018 yeah so it's been five years maybe six years I don't know okay so what is life like for someone who is thriving like what what is your life like not drinking well the way that I always explain it is like my life is the same but before without knowing it, I was operating at 70% and now I operate at hundred percent. So like the main difference, like, I think for me, what was the most difficult with drinking was, you know, I was also managing a team and I was always on flights. Like when I was working at Garcia, because I was doing their retail, I was either scouting a new location or visiting the LA store or whatever pop-up was currently open. And so I was, you know, taking probably two flights a week and then spending the other half of the week in New York and managing a team and so it's like you have to come to work early if you're going to do your own work and prep for the day before your team comes in and I was just like not really wanting to talk to people before 10 30 in the morning you know it's just like you're just a yeah. little bit foggy and that was the one thing where I, and by the way I was never a big drinker like I know that saying that like makes me sound like an alcoholic but I was probably having one to two glasses of wine out at dinner two or three times a week which I think is like not that much for someone who lives no, in, in America. No, in America, it's definitely not that much. Yeah. Right? It's like maybe three, three to five glasses a week, I would say. Like never really hard alcohol. I never really loved that. If I was hosting at my house on like a Friday night, like, you know, I used to live with my friend. Um, he was in charge of the bar and he made really great Negronis. So that's obviously like a bit of a stronger drink. So I would have one Negroni or something like that, basically. So I, I was not a big drinker whatsoever, um, ever really. But now, you know, I wake up and like I have some, I jump out of bed, you know, <laughs> like I have so much energy uh, and I sleep so much better. And I was always kind of a light sleeper. So even though there's still like progress to be made on that front, I think that's the main, the main difference. But, you know, I, I definitely socialize a lot um, and I definitely, you know, I definitely like cook for a large table at least once a week. Um, I also, now that I live in LA, I'm just like, I hike and I surf and I'm so outdoorsy and I do that all before work. So yeah, I, I think also living here, it lends itself to going to bed early and waking up early, but you know, I have no problem going out and you know, I love concerts and I love dancing and you know, I definitely um, have a very active social life. So that's now that I'm very comfortable with not drinking, it's, I, I feel much better. 
how do you deal with when you're out and everyone else is drunk around you and you're not? Because I, that's where I'm at right now. It's like at that wedding, I was like, whoa. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I, I mean, I had a Negroni and I had a lot of non alcoholic drinks. But like, I was like, oh my well, God. Well, it's kind of I'm funny because <laughs> at first, when you stop drinking, you're like, you kind of wish that you had the social lubricants that everybody had, like the yeah. first drink in your head when you get to a party or whatnot. And then it's like, 2 a.m. and you're like, oh, you're, you're so glad that you're not on that level. Uh, but also there's a part of it where it's just like by osmosis, I, I think you end up having fun no matter what, because if everyone is like having a blast around you, like, of course, the energy is like lights, you know, and and so there's a lot of like a lot of people say like, oh, if I'm having if I'm having a guia with my friends who are drinking, I feel like I'm drunk because like I often get the question like are you sure there's nothing in this and I'm like I'm sure like 100% sure um because that's you know I don't I, I think that there's also a lot of like it's very atmospheric like what you need is the ingredient is you it's not the booze the main ingredient in like this is you and I think that's the message we're trying to convey I absolutely love it. Okay. So this podcast is for people who are eager to live in fulfillment and they're eager to live in a life that's in, in full alignment. It seems to me like right now you have discovered this within you. That seems like an extension of your family, of your soul. And you seem to be living in a life with alignment that you're surfing before work. You know, it seems great. What advice would you give to someone who wants that for themselves that doesn't necessarily know exactly how to go about it or how to follow the path to get them there? Um, well, first of all, I think I would say like, turn off your Instagram. Like this is like a nice summary of my life, but it's also like, I've been working until midnight, like every day this week, you know, it's just like life is also really crazy for most people sometimes. And you don't see everything. Uh, I haven't surfed in two weeks, you know, for that reason. So, um, I, I think that it's sometimes easy to feel like everybody else is, has it under control when you don't, but you know, I think I really go by the mantra, like how you spend your days is how you spend your life. So it's really about finding these like small, joyful moments in every bit of what you do, whether it's like, you know, this week, like the whole team is in town and we're really doing like a big power. And it's like, I know there's like one day where I want to like cook for them, you know, and like, I've already decided what I'm going to make. And I want to take this moment where we're all together to like have a shared meal or it can be just, you know, I don't know, like deciding to like meet a certain way or, you know, just going on like a super quick 20 minute run before work or trying to like, you know, I know that when I don't move my body, for instance, like my mind also starts to go. And so it's like even finding like walking to work in the morning or finding these little bits or sitting in the sun, taking a walk, meeting, you know, I think it's totally fine in these like post COVID days to say like, I'm not turning my camera on because I really wanted to move my legs and walk for 30 minutes. Like people appreciate that. It doesn't really matter. So I think it's like about all of the small bits adding together. There's not like one miracle formula. Out of everything that you're doing, what is the thing? It it doesn't even have to be what you're doing just in life. What is the thing that you feel is what makes you feel the most alive, which is what we call active ingredient here. Like what is the thing that you feel most alive in? I don't know. There are many things, but I think, you know, I just like, I just love cooking for my friends. So I think it's like, I've been doing a lot of like Sunday lunches and it's like Sunday morning, I go to the market, decide, you know, what's, see what's in season and what looks good. And then just, you know, have everyone come around like 1 PM and just linger through the afternoon. It's so nice. And it's really something that like makes me feel super happy to be home. It feels like home. I love that so, so much. What is next for Gia? Where can people find Gia right now other than on the website? Um, well, we have 650 accounts, uh, which you, on the website, there's a stockist page uh-huh. so you can see where it is near you or, you know, we ship everything really quickly. So you can also order on the website. If you haven't tried it yet, you can use Melanie 15 for 15 percent off oh. your first order. Uh, we're launching a new spritz flavor, which actually has lime in it. So that will happen before summer. Um, Very and then intuitive. We are launching a little starter pack um, very soon for people that want to try it, but maybe don't know whether they can commit to the full bottle or what spritz they would like. So we're just doing like a small bottle and like one of each, so that people can try everything at like a lower price point. Um, because we understand that like things get expensive in nowadays. So uh, and then we are also have like a surprise product that's coming in May. 
That's so cool. exciting. <laughs> I'm so impressed. I'm, I'm very, very grateful for you to create this product to make it easier for people that want to choose this for themselves in their life. Um, and I'm excited to see what you guys do next. I really am. I am genuinely grateful. Like I really, really am. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. Is there anything else that you want to share? I think that's it. Just have fun with it. Try it and let me know how you drink it. <laughs> amazing. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.